Well, I see a few empty chairs, so I don't know if that's the rain or my sermon from last week. Um, if you're visiting with us, you know, just like to say, we don't really have anything spectacular around here for you. <laughs> I mean, all we got is worship and the Word of God. We don't have any smoke machines. We don't have any uh, laser light shows going on. But I'll tell you, the Word of God, it's better than spectacular. Um, it's Thanksgiving week, right? I don't think we as believers need a day and some turkey to be thankful, do we? We should be thankful every Sunday. I, I always say Easter. We have Easter every Sunday. Jesus is alive and He has made us alive. So for true Christians... And it's, it's, it's every Sunday. So let's be thankful every Sunday. And again, we hear the gospel. And, and I think people get misguided. And they think, well, man, I heard the gospel 20 years ago. and gave my life to Christ. So I need to hear something else. Really? What else is there? You need to hear the gospel every day. Not that you get saved all over again. You, you come to Christ once and you're in. But the gospel reminds me, when I start trying to do things on my own, figure things out on my own, what do I do? I preach the gospel. Reminds me back of who I am. That I can't do anything without my Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're going verse by verse through the book of Romans. We were there last week. And through the book of John. And uh, sometimes it's one verse. Some, most of the time it's a paragraph. Sometimes it might be a chapter if everything goes together. Uh, John's gospel, everything John is saying is Jesus is God. He is going to show us that Jesus said things that only God could say, and Jesus did things that only God can do. And at the end of the book, he says, I'm writing this so you'll believe in him and put your trust in him. So we left down, we're going to look at the next paragraph. Let's read verses 35 through 42. Well, we just talked about John the Baptist. He gave testimony of who Jesus is. And here's John again with some disciples. And here's the first encounter with some of Jesus' followers or the 12 disciples. So verse 35 says, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. And so they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So I want to break this down. I'm just going to make four points. Um, I'm going to have mercy on you today. I preached like two sermons last week, so we'll, we'll do one today. <laughs> but let's, let's look at this. I want you, I want you to see the first, first point here in here. Let's look at the divine initiation. The divine initiation. This is when Christ initially first encounters His disciples. So it says, The next day again, John was standing with the two of His disciples, and He looked at Jesus as He walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard Him say this, and they followed Jesus. So this is after John the Baptist um, is testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. We've already talked about the Lamb of God last week and what that meant. 
And now, he's standing with two of his disciples. We believe that the two disciples, we're, we know one of them is Andrew because he tells us. The other one is not mentioned, and we believe that's probably John himself. Uh, not John the Baptist, but John himself, because John never refers to himself. And why does he do that? And, and even toward the end, of the, as we get later on in the book, he refers to himself as the one Jesus loved. What's he doing there? He's, he's, he's doing what Jesus taught him. He's trying to be humble. It's not about me. Who cares about me? I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And I love that about him. And we all need to learn a lesson from that. Man, we all need humility. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. This universe was created for Jesus, you know, not for you. <laughs> and when we realize that, man, it, 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 humility will give you peace. Humility will give you peace. And we all, have to, I mean, I remember growing up, growing up, running around the town as a teenager, and we'd ride in the car, and everybody would, we would get in fist fights over the front seat. You know, you'd have to, when you turn the key off, you had to say shotgun. I don't know if any of you all did that. We did that. So whoever said shotgun got the first seat. And man, we were so proud of ourselves when we said shotgun. We were so proud of ourselves in that front seat. I get to look out the window. People can look in and see how wonderful I am. You know? <laughs> hey, when you become a follower of Jesus, when I became a follower of Jesus, I now understand I need to get in the back. I need to get in the back. I need to let put others in front. That's what Jesus said. So John's just practicing humility by not uh, mentioning himself. So... <clears throat> John says, behold the Lamb of God. What is that? He's preaching the cross. He's the last Old Testament prophet preaching the cross. Saying, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the one that's going to make a sacrifice for your sins. And the Old Testament talked about this. And I know there are misguided teachers telling you that the Old Testament is not important. I know some of you got these books by these people. And listen, if you have a Christian book that's saying the Old Testament is not important, it's getting cool outside. Build yourself a fire. <laughs> Start yourself a fire. Throw those books in there. The Old Testament looked forward to Jesus. It was all about Jesus. The New Testament, we look back toward Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So John is preaching the cross. He says, there, here's your Savior. He's going to be your sacrifice. John says, I must decrease. He must increase. Follow Him. Follow Him. And us pastors can learn from that. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Paul did say, follow me as I follow Christ. So if I do anything that, that is similar to what Jesus would do, you can follow that. But the rest of the stuff Frank does, forget about that. Don't follow that, okay? It's all about Jesus. Number two, let's look at the divine investigation. Call this the divine investigation. Verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? <laughs> So, this is the first statement Jesus makes in this important gospel of, God, uh, gospel of John of who Jesus is. And the first statement he makes is a question. And he asks these disciples, what are you seeking? Think about that. Now, I hope you know God never, never asks questions for information. He's up to something with this. He's asking them this, this question because he wants, he wants to see what their he wants them to see and think about what, what are their motives. Some Bible translations say, What do you want? And maybe God is saying that today to you. Hey, why are you here? What are you seeking? What do you really want 
from God? That's something we need to ask ourselves. Because we're going to see, we're going to see in John's gospel, many people followed Christ for the wrong reasons and they had the wrong motives. And that's why they didn't last. And I mean, because Jesus, Jesus had a crowd, 5,000, when he fed the 5,000, it's 5,000 men. So that was probably 20,000 counting women and children. And he preached a, a powerful sermon. And they all left. They couldn't take the commitment he was talking about. Jesus saying, I want, I want all of your life. And they didn't want it. And we're going to see that. And I think we see that in the world today. I've talked about it. We've got a lot of fans of Jesus, but we've got few followers. And everybody wants to come and be entertained and feel good. And I'm telling you, I've been doing this now close to 40 years. I have counseled thousands of people talking to them about God. And here's the sad thing. Most of them, they wanted an aspirin but they didn't want to cure their disease. And so some people come, they want to feel good, give me an aspirin, help me with what I'm going through right now, do something for me, God. But Jesus is saying, you want to follow me? I need all of you. And I'm not just going to give you an aspirin, I'm going to cure your disease. And, and, And I am going to transform your life. So I think we got to ask, why are we here? Are we willing to surrender? Are we, are we really willing to follow with all of our heart, with all of our soul? And I know we can't do that perfectly, but the Holy Spirit helps us to go in that direction. And yes, we all stumble. We all get off track. And the church, when we get off track, we help each other get back on track. And if the church can't help us, Jesus will reach down and grab you and put you back on track. Somehow, some way. But we have to really examine our motives of why are we following Jesus. And so they answer him and they say, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, they, don't, they really don't answer the question that Jesus asks. They answer with another question. And this just reminds me of how mad my wife gets at me. When she asks me a question, and I follow up with another question. I don't even answer. I don't know if you have that going on in your marriage. But, uh, you know, and I just think because men and women, we don't understand each other. So I didn't understand the question. So I just asked her a question. Maybe she'll understand that question, right? We've been married 40 years. We shouldn't have to ask each other anything, right? (laughs) What do you do with that? Well... You got two people, you follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. And God brings you closer together and there's a bond. And that's the answer. And and see, everybody, you got something on your mind. You got something you want me to preach about to help you. Listen, follow Jesus and it all comes together. Everything in your life. So... They, they answer with a question, and they say, they call him rabbi, which means teacher. Now, you've got to understand, what they're, what they're, they're paying Jesus a great compliment. They're, they're, saying, they're saying, we have respect for you. We now want, John the Baptist was our rabbi. He was our teacher. But now, we want you to be our teacher. So where are you staying? In the Greek, meno. Where are you abiding? The Gospel of John talks a lot about abiding in Christ. And so, you know, they're, they're not saying, um, what they're saying is, Jesus, where are you hanging out? Because wherever you're hanging out, that's where we want to hang out. And we want you to teach us. We want to learn from you. And hopefully that's your motive. Hopefully you're here because you want to learn from Jesus. You... you You want to be where He is and you want to abide in Him in every area of your life. Number three, let's see the divine invitation. 
Verse 39, He said to them, Come, and you will see. And so they saw where He was staying, and they stayed with Him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now what a great day this must have been, right? Their first encounter with Jesus Christ. Another reason why it, it, we can tell it's John, because John says it was the 10th hour. Hey, it was 10 a.m., and I remember. I remember that day. It was 10 a.m. When, when I met my Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you remember that day? I don't think you have to know the date. People get all nervous. I can't remember the date. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? But do you remember the moment? And are you still following? That's the proof. Man, I remember the day. What a great day of coming to Jesus Christ. So this was a great day for them. And they stayed with Him. And I love, you know, I titled my sermon, Come and You Will See. And it's the words of Jesus. I hope, I hope you see more in that, come and you will see, than, hey, come and check out this cool apartment there, let me stay at. No, come and you will see things you've never dreamed of. Come and you will see. And God is saying to every one of you, anybody watching, you come and you will see. You will see God do an incredible, incredible work in your life. The Bible, there's so many verses about God saying come and they're all... They're all good. Isaiah 1, 18. The first part of verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your skins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. God's saying, come. Reason with me. I want to get along with you. I want to love you. I want to cleanse you. Their sins are like scarlet. Scarlet is blood color. You might walk in here and you're bloody with your sin. Bloody with your sin. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean you up. I'm going to make you clean. And Jesus, that bloody cross, He did that for you. And so spiritually, when you come to Christ, He can make you clean. You can walk out of here refreshed. And Christians, Christians, yes, our sins are forgiven past, present, and the future, but when we sin, 1 John, John writes, we can confess our sin. Not that we need that for forgiveness, but it just restores the relationship. God's all about, He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want religion. He doesn't want you trying to follow the rules and doing it. He wants you to come to Him, reason with Him, have fellowship with Him. And let Him clean you up. Jesus said, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, one of my favorite things. He says, Come to Me, all you who are labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, Come to Man, if you, if, if you are burdened, if you have no rest in your soul, please come to Me. I want to give you rest for your soul. He's not saying, come to me and you can quit your job and lay on the couch. No, he's talking about your soul. It's so much more important. And you know what? If your soul is right, and your soul is resting, you can handle that lousy job a lot better. So he wants to give you rest. Revelation 1.17, almost the last, very last verses. John, again, writes in Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. The Spirit and the Bride, who's that? Well, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit could draw in you this morning saying, come, come. Who's the bride? That's us, the church. That's our job to go out and tell people, come and you will see. 
Come, and you will see, and he will quench your thirst. Some of you, you're thirsty. You're thirsty. You're going straight to the store because <laughs> you're thirsty. And you're hoping that it'll quench your thirst. That thirst, that emptiness thirst, you know. But it's just like drinking salt water. You just remain thirsty. And so you try something else, and you try this, and you try that. And Jesus says, I'm the only one that can satisfy the thirst for your soul. So he says, come, and you will see. Later on, in, this, in the next paragraph of John, we meet, we meet a guy named Nathaniel. I love Nathaniel. I named a son Nathaniel, because I love Nathaniel so much. And actually, we're going to make Nathaniel preach on Nathaniel. How about that? <laughs> but Jesus tells Nathaniel, you know, he sees Nathaniel. He's under the fig tree. There's nobody there but Nathaniel and his Bible and God. And Nathaniel meets Jesus, and Nathaniel says, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And that freaked Nathaniel out. Because he's thinking, hey, wait a minute. It was only me and God. Yeah. And God just says, I saw you under the fig tree. And then, but then Jesus said, Nathaniel, you are going to see so much greater things than these. And we'll learn about that. That's going to be a fabulous passage of Scripture. Ephesians 3.20 says it this way. Now to him, Jesus Christ, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. Love that verse. Man, when I, man, I was such a mess and when I became a Christian, I never dreamed what God would do in my life in so many ways. And that's what this is saying. Come and see. Because God can do far more abundantly than you can imagine. You can think. But he's not going to show you that. He just says, come and you will see. You got to come. And I promise you will see. Next scriptures that goes with this divine invitation, verses 40 and 41. He says, one of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ, which means Savior. Jesus Christ, that's his title. So that Christ is not his last name, that's his title. He's Jesus the Savior. And that's what I'm saying. What a day this was for them. They're like, man, we have found the Messiah. You got you to meet this guy. Where do you hear him speak? Where do you look into his eyes, you know? And, I, and I, I love that about that. And I call this the divine invitation because, number one, Jesus gives, he initiates. He says, come and see. So the Holy Spirit initiates in your life, come and see. And then when you come and see and you meet Jesus, you know what your response is going to be? You're going to want to tell somebody else. You're going to want to invite somebody else. We don't need to give you some evangelism class for you to do that. That is naturally just what you're going to want to do. You find Jesus Christ and He changes your life and you know He's real and you know He's true. You're going to go and invite somebody else. That's just the way it works. And I love this. You know, Andrew, Andrew, this disciple, one of the followers, Andrew doesn't really do anything famous in the Gospels, does he? I mean, all he does is invite his brother Peter, who becomes the leader of the disciples, who writes New Testament books. Andrew doesn't write a book. The only other thing Andrew did when we see that, that feeding of the 20,000 people is, you know, he brings a little boy that has five, five loaves of bread and two fish. 
Now, you know the other disciples are thinking, hey, look at Andrew. He's got a fish sandwich happy meal. We've got to feed 20,000 people. Once again, they underestimated the power of the one they were following. And Jesus took that happy meal and fed 20,000 people out of the air. That must have been amazing to see. And learn that. The little you give Jesus, he will turn it into a lot. Come to him. Come. And you will see. And so it's the power of invitation. And I think, I think all of you could test. We could, we could give a testimony. We, we could put a microphone up here. Just come up here and tell us the person that invited you to church. And one after another, you would come up and you would remember it. Somebody gave you a divine invitation. Some Christian invited you, but truly, it was divine. It was God calling you, saying, come, come to me. Number four, and finally, I want you to see the divine innovation, the divine innovation. Innovation, if a company says, hey, we're going to have some innovation, they're saying, we're going to make some changes. We're going we're gonna to transform things around here. We're going to make things better. And that's what Jesus Christ does. Verse 42 says he, he brought him to Jesus. Andrew goes and gets his brother. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, but you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. You know, um, I, I, uh, when I got saved, one of the first things I did was tell my brothers about Jesus. And one thing, when my, when my brother Mark passed away and I had that last conversation with him, one thing that made me cry and cried all over Mark, Darla had to get toilet paper out of the restroom and come and wipe me up and wipe Mark's arm. Because Mark said to me, he said, Frank, it started with you and it started with Darla. And he wasn't giving glory to us. He was just saying, it was the work God did on you. You found Jesus and then you come and you told me. And Mark became such a great follower of Jesus and he's with Jesus now. Tell your brothers, tell your sister, tell your family. Don't yell at them. Don't scream at them. Just love them. Just say, I love you. I'm praying for you. Come and see. And it might take time. But they, God will answer your prayer. And God will work on those loved ones. But, so anyway here, so what is this? I mean, Jesus says, okay, you're called Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. What's the big deal? Jesus gives nicknames. He's going to give me a nickname. No, the big deal is, this is speaking of transformation. And the idea of Jesus changing Simon to Peter, because Peter means rock. It means stability. And we're gonna, we'll read it, and we see it, and all throughout the gospel, you read about Peter's life. Peter's unstable. He's a loud mouth. He's always putting his foot in his mouth. He's out of control at times. They come to arrest Jesus. He's cutting people's ears off. The guy was unstable. And what Jesus is saying, Peter, you don't know it now. You're unstable. Man, you're... But I'm going to make you into a rock. You're going to be one of the most stable human beings that have ever walked this planet. And we see that in the book of Acts. The new Peter, Peter the Rock, Peter, man, read the book of 1 Peter. Man, I love 1 You know what? We might go to 1 Peter. I mean, we're, we're probably going to be in John and Romans until Jesus comes, but <laughs> man, 1 Peter's awesome. Jesus doesn't promise to make you rich. Jesus pr doesn't promise to make you worldly successful or even he healthy or even happy all the time. But he promises, come and see 
and he will make you stable and you will be stronger than ever. And it's just following him. It's just seeking him. You, you don't even know how it happens. God does that work, that divine work within you. So, I want to tell you a story about divine invitation and how important it is to invite people to church. You know, church, ministry can be hard. Ministry can be hard. And those who minister with me and are close to me, they sometimes see how hard it can be. Anybody in the ministry totally understands. Jeremy Levine, just, <laughs> he knows. He's a minister. And in ministry and in all the, the stress, God is so good and God does work. And whenever God does something amazing, and a divine invitation takes place and somebody comes and gives their heart to Christ, all the frustration, all the hard work, it, it, it's, it's just so worth it, you know? My son Nathaniel has been giving me a lot of help. He, is, he has found out the stress of the ministry. And every time something crazy happens, I always say to him, welcome to the ministry, right? Uh. You know, not just long ago, we were in the Cultural Center Theater. How long ago? That's not, not long ago, right? We had our plans. We had, we're going to do this. The Cultural Center is wiped out. <laughs> Welcome to the ministry. <laughs> but here we are. Here we are. God has done so much good. God has worked in so many. Some of you have gotten more involved because of it. You're helping now. You're a part of us even more. God knows what he's doing in the ministry. Uh, Michael Fear knows about the ministry. He's become an administrator of our church. I think he has a spiritual gift of administration. It's made our church so much excellent for the glory of God. But yet it's hard. and he, It's hard. But it's worth it when we hear these stories. So let me tell you a story. I'll close. Um... John Thistle, very involved in our church, very involved in our ministry. He's a mechanic. He does some other little stuff on the side, you know, but uh, he's, he's a lay person. But John invites people to church. John, John invited a guy named Jim Fine to our church. Jim Fine came. He came to the cultural center. It's a big guy, sat in the back, quiet. I could always see him back in the, in the back, wore a hat. And he listened. He heard the Word of God. The Spirit of God drew him. He started coming to Wednesday night church and we had Sable building and uh, I was doing questions and answers. He could ask me questions about the Bible and he came and he loved it. And he just loved the Word of God and I was able, afterwards I was able to talk to him and shared Jesus with him. And he surrendered his life. He gave his heart to Christ. And I gave him a study Bible. And that's the power of invitation. John invites Jim to church. Jim comes to church. He hears the word of God. God works on Jim. God draws Jim. And he becomes a believer in Christ. Uh, a few months ago, Jim had some health issues, and he had heart surgery. And uh, the doctors told him, hey, surgery, everything went well. But that night, he died in his sleep next to his wife. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. All because John invited Jim, and Jim came. A divine invitation. Jim is now in heaven with God. That makes it all worth it to me. But the story doesn't end there. Jim, Jim's wife lying next to him, who, who loved Jim so much, she never would come to church with Jim. Jim would come home and tell her what he had learned, but, but she just wasn't really interested. She, she had no church upbringing. She was just kind of confused by it all. She was happy for Jim. 
but really didn't want to come to church. So Jim would pray for her. He would invite her. He would talk to her about it. After Jim passed away, Jim wrote a letter for his wife to find. And in this letter, it said to Cheryl, Cheryl, if you found this letter, I'm gone. I'm gone. Cheryl, I want you to find out. I want you to, I want you to contact Freedom Bible Church. And I want you to contact Frank Vargo. And I want you to talk to him about becoming a Christian and receiving Jesus Christ so you can be with me again in heaven one day. Cheryl, what's she going to do with that? She called John Thistle. She said, John, i got to find out where your church is. And who is this Frank Vargo guy? So, of course, you know, John calls me and lets me know. So I call her. Had a great talk with her on the phone. She came to church. Right before the hurricane, I held hands with her on her couch. And she put her faith in Jesus Christ. The power of divine invitation. Let me tell you something. Everything we do in the ministry, every chair we move, every chair we set up, it matters. Because we are doing the work of God. And yeah, it doesn't seem to be spectacular, does it? But it's better than that. It's better than that. So maybe we all need to go home and write a letter just in case. <laughs> to all these people we've been trying to invite in our family and all our loved ones and friends, make sure they get that letter after we die because that's powerful, right? I don't know where you're at today. You might be lost, confused. You don't know what to do. The only thing I can tell you is, come and you will see. Come and you will see. Pray with me this morning. Let's pray. And as we uh, bow in prayer, I pray that you would have thank. If you're already a believer in Jesus Christ, man, how does this, how does this these verses not make you so thankful? that Jesus called you to follow Him and you responded. That He wants to give you peace and joy and make you stable. So in this moment, Christian, just be thankful to God. Christians, pray, pray for others. Pray for that person you're thinking about. You've been trying to invite and they won't come. Pray for them. Invite them again. Give it another try. Say a prayer and invite them again. The power of invitation is amazing. God's behind it. I, if someone's here, you, you stumbled in here, and you don't, you've never really surrendered yet. You don't even know how to surrender. You just, you just go towards Jesus. You just come and see. You just, you just you come to church. Jesus established the church. It's His church. You come to church. You learn. You grow. But you put your faith in Him and you, you tell God. You, you're honest with God. God, I, I'm sinful. I can't help myself. I can't. Jesus, I need You to save me. Please take over my life. I want to follow You. And if you're sincere, Jesus will help you to follow Him. God, thank you so much for your church. God, it, it, it's such a joy to be here. God, I, I just don't even think we realize how thankful we should be to be able to come and, and worship you and, and hear your word, and yet we understand it and we love it. And God, you've saved us from just so much turmoil. You've saved us from hell, Lord. You've saved us from hell on earth and worse than that, an eternity in hell. 
Lord, help us to be like Andrew. Help us to be excited about our faith in Jesus. Help us to go and invite others. Help us to be kind to others, gracious to others. May we never get tired of the gospel, the good news you have given us, Lord. This Christmas season, it's all about the gospel, the good news that you came for us. May we worship you throughout this entire season. God, now as we close, I pray that our hearts would, we would lift our hearts as we lift our voices to you and worship your great name. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.